late. Let's get this show on the road. All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. If you have a hymnal, let's turn over to hymn number 247, Saved by the Blood. 247, let's all stand. Great. Good job singing. I hope that you know that this evening. I hope that you're singing your testimony when you say that. Amen. Uh, saved by the blood of the crucified one. If you're saved, that's how you're saved, by the way. There is no other way other than by the blood of the crucified one. Good to have you here tonight. Do trust you've had a great day. And it's been one of those busy days. And we've had uh, uh, men's choir practice today. And ladies, you'll be glad to know that we accomplished more in one hour than you did in three. Well, that may not be exactly true, but we're proud of ourselves, aren't we, gentlemen? Amen. We made it through, and Miss Cheryl didn't throw anything at one of us. Not at one of us. And, uh, but uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. And, uh, so, and uh, so you be in prayer for the, the choir as we, everybody gets ready. And by the way, it's not too late if you want to sign up, men or women, young or old, male or female, the choir is still available for you to join in. And also we have some play parts. If you don't want to sing, but you want to be involved in the program and you want to have some of the speaking parts, then we have some of those still available too. So uh, you just let us know and we'll plug you right in, all righty? And uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Let's pray and ask for his blessing upon this evening. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for this day. And Lord, what a wonderful privilege it is to be a child of God and saved, 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 as we've just singing about all day long. This song we just sang, Lord, your wonderful, wonderful grace, your blood that was shed on Calvary for us that provides salvation, not only for a day, but for eternity, Lord. And not only for those that come to this church or those that go to any church, but Lord, for all those that believe, 
Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for that, for paying for that uh, wonderful, wonderful gift of salvation. I ask you now, Lord, to be with us and guide us tonight as we have so much to do, Lord. Uh, in, in the short days that you've given us, we have so much, Lord, so many people to witness to and so many people to be an example of Christ to. There's so much growing in our own life to do spiritually. Lord, help us to be exactly what you'd have us to be. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of living in this country where we can come and publicly assemble ourselves together. Lord, I pray for our nation. I ask you right now to uh, keep your hand upon our nation. Lord, we've been blessed by you for Many generations, Lord, but our, our country is quickly, uh, Lord, we're sorry to say we're turning our back upon you and the things of holiness and righteousness. Lord, I pray that those of Christ, those of the bride of Christ, those those have trusted you by faith, Lord, of our country. Uh, Lord, the, the uh, numbers and scores of people, Lord, that have been saved will take a stand, that will declare your righteousness and holiness, Lord, to those that make the decisions and uphold the laws of our land. And, Lord, they, that we would be the, the majority voice as we cry out in, in voting, Lord, and we would let them know that we're expecting them to represent us. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help us now, Lord, to pray for our military. Lord, help us to be faithful in praying for our military as they protect us right now. Lord, many of them need to know you as their Savior. And, Lord, we pray for their protection, Lord, but not only for that, but, Lord, that there will be someone in their way that, that, Lord, that you placed in their way to give them the gospel before it's eternally too late. And, Lord, for our missionaries that, are, that represent this church and other churches like this around the globe, Lord, I pray that the gospel will be preached and there will be fruits for the labor. And, Lord, give us fruits for the labor in this community. Lord, help us to be faithful and diligent in our, in our walk. Help us walk worthy of the vocation where we, wherewith we have been called. I will give you the praise and glory for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You did so good singing that song. Let's sing some more. Amen. All right. Let's turn over to hymn number 262. Yes, I know. 262. forward gentlemen if you would and don't forget uh, ladies if you want to go to ladies meeting I know the numbers continue to grow and praise the Lord for that about that uh, but my wife does need to let Miss Debbie know tomorrow they already have over 200 ladies scheduled to come to this meeting matter of fact it's it's to the point to where they literally the churches that, that have not responded they're having to call them and ask them maybe that they can't come to this one because they just don't have the room for them uh, so since we've responded, we need to uh, continue to respond and, and give them a number tomorrow. So if you're going to this ladies' meeting, and by the way, how many of you went to the last ladies' meeting? It's been two or three years ago down at Sun and Shield, and, and I know you've been to ones up, and, and that, they do a great job down there, phenomenal job with that. Uh, so be sure and see my wife tonight if you want to go to that. 
and uh, that is on the 22nd of this month. It's a Saturday morning, so let her know. Transportation, of course, will be provided for that if you'd like, and uh, we'd love for you to go. And then men, right after that, the very following weekend, 28th and 29th, the men's meeting at North Valley Baptist Church up in North Phoenix, and uh, if you want to go to that. And then also, this Thursday night, ladies, you have another scheduled practice, and uh, men, we have another one next Sunday. Uh, so, and the next Sunday morning, right after the morning service, we'll be meeting just briefly with everyone to pass out the parts for the program. Not really practicing, but just kind of give an overview and the parts and things like that. So, you help us pray about this. There's a lot to be done and short time to do it. So, let's pray the Lord would work in, in these things and get the glory. Amen. But, Ron, if you would ask for his blessing upon the offering. Lord, no, I thank you. Amen. Turn over to him number 256. Are you washed in the blood? 256. going to be turning over to 
Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Good to have Miss Frida back tonight. We were missing her this morning. And uh, so good to have her back. And good to have these visitors with us this morning as well. And I do be in prayer for uh, several people that are still out tonight. Some of our folks are traveling still yet. Uh, got about three families, I think, uh, traveling. And then uh, we have uh, some that uh, are under the weather and having some sickness. So you'll be in prayer for that and then be in prayer for Dee Dee, as uh, I guess Ron maybe mentioned, she is, a, or someone did, she's having continued difficulty there and she flies home on Tuesday, so you'll be in prayer for her. This is John and Sue's daughter and then be in prayer uh, for our church and those that are away from us for whatever reason. And let's just ask the Lord to help us and guide us through this time and through this season. Uh, I do appreciate all of you ladies getting together yesterday and practicing and in the uh, men today, and, and I, I want to commend you for that very, very much. Uh, giving up your time for the Lord is something you will never regret. Uh, it may be an inconvenience at a moment. You have to, may have to lay some things down. Yesterday, I was thinking about that, about the funeral at Bo's funeral. There was a lot of farmers at that funeral. That meant yesterday, the cotton pickers wasn't running. They set aside something for something else. And there's some things in your life and things in my life, if we're not careful, we need to evaluate sometimes and say, there's some things that need to be done at certain times. And, and, and just like in your life and mine, we may have a schedule and a plan, and all of us do that. By the way, all of us do that. And it's a good thing to have that. And my life needs to be more scheduled in all honesty. But if something tragic happens in your family, you get a phone call. A loved one is hurting. A loved one's sick. A loved one's in an accident. Do you say, well, I would love to come to the hospital and see you, but I can't, I have. You don't do that, do you? You just put things in a different order to get things done. And, and if there's something that can't get done for whatever reason, then you just pick out the one that's the least important and has the least eternal value, and you lay that aside. Sometimes our schedule changes, and I want to thank you and commend you on letting your schedule be changed for the next few weeks as you get ready for this program. I say to you, I'll echo these, these thoughts of Ms. Sherrill, and, and I completely concur. One of the blessings, one of the blessings, one of the blessings of this church, and there's many, but one of them is the fact that their people want to be involved. And I love that. Uh, I love your involvement. I love your uh, spontaneity. I love the fact that you're willing to get involved and, and be part of something uh, because you have a picture, you have a view, you have a vision, the Bible calls it, of the greater picture. There's something that's going to be done for the glory of God that may influence others to come to know Christ. And, and we may just be sowing the seed today, and the fruit may not be there. Uh, yesterday, Friday, Friday it was, uh, the grass got mowed down low as the summer grass now will be dying off quickly. So we mowed it down low, and Jacob, I should say, not we, I didn't do it, but Jacob mowed it down low, and, and then the seed was sown, the rye, the winter rye grass was sown, and the seed is sown, and the water's been on, turned on extra times for the next few days until the seed germinates. And we may not see the fruit today, but we're trusting that there'll be fruit, right? And the seed gets sown sometimes in our life, and, and we may not know what's going on today, but you just sow the seed. We just sow the seed. And at times we'll have an opportunity to water it. We don't have to worry about the increase because it's God that giveth the increase. We're not accountable. We're not responsible for the increase. We're responsible for the sowing and the watering. So I want you to be in prayer about these things. And again, I want to thank you and commend you for your willingness to put this time in practicing. And I want to thank you uh, for doing it for the Lord. Romans chapter 3 tonight, a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, a very often used and quoted chapter of the Bible. But I really ask a question of myself and, and I challenge you to ask the same question of yourself. Just because we know some verses of the Bible, there's probably not a week goes by when I don't use Romans chapter 3 in some way or another. Honestly. But I question myself, and I'm asking you to challenge yourself with the same question. Do I really know what Romans chapter 3 is saying? I mean, we can, we can quote some of the verses. We can, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all of sin that come short of the glory of God. We've talked recently about, about the fact that, that, that He is our suitable sacrifice. What's that word? Somebody tell me that word. That suitable sacrifice for sin. Anybody remember? Propitiation. Romans chapter 3. 
We've talked about so much, and I want you to pray with me and pray for me tonight as we look at this. We're going to do a, a quick overview of the entire chapter. We won't spend a lot of time on any verse particularly, but I want us to just notice something because I'm very ba- I, I try not to be, I try to be diligent about this, but I, I'm, I'm guilty. I try to be, I try not to cut sentences off in Scripture. And by that I mean, I do try to pay attention to the punctuation, and I, but I'm guilty of not always doing that. I quoted two verses a moment ago, two verses of the Bible from Romans chapter 3, and I used both of them as, they had a, as if they had a period at the end of them, and neither one of them do. So I want to challenge us this evening to think about Romans chapter 3 and any other passage the Bible the Lord lays on our hearts, but tonight let's look at Romans chapter 3 and see if we can't maybe grasp a greater picture of what God is telling us here as as these chapters of the Bible, these early chapters of the book of Romans are are chapters that deal with the lost condition of man. It's chapters that we can go to to show people their need of a Savior. It's chapters that you and I can show our friends, our family, our co-workers, our classmates. And truth be told, they're not super difficult to understand if we would just try to read them and put forth some effort in understanding them. We're going to cover a couple things tonight that maybe is a little bit of a stumbling block for me in the past. uh, Maybe not for you. I have a different kind of mind and And we all do, but uh, we thank the Lord for what He's given us and the ability to understand. Amen. Romans chapter 3 verse 1 says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Now I want you to think about this real quickly. The very first verse says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? In other words, is there a real benefit, and what is the benefit, and, and what's, the, what's the glory that they want to cling to for being a Jew? Notice this, verse uh, 2. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. When David Sloan was here, he brought one of the greatest messages I think I've ever heard in my life. One of the greatest messages I've ever heard in my life. Back a few years ago, when we hosted our statewide fellowship. And by the way, we're doing that again in February. Ladies and, and gentlemen, if you'd like to help us with that, with the preparation of the food and the building and the property, we're hosting our church's honor to be hosting another statewide preacher's fellowship. What an honor that is. We hosted this last time. David Sloan was having a meeting, and David Sloan was preaching for us, and he preached a message, I believe it was on Monday night, on everything we have, we can thank God that he gave it to us through the Jews. Let me remember that message, or at least a portion of it. I only remember a portion of it. I wish I could retain it all. But he talked to us about we, have, we are so blessed. But at the same time, he talk, tells us to pray for Israel. And one of the reasons we're to pray for Israel, and reason, one of the reasons we're to ask God to bless them is because everything that we have, everything that we have and enjoy, came through Israel first. And we find out that confirmed right here in verse 2 of Romans chapter 3. What's one of the advantages? What's one of the, what's one of the if you will let me let, use it this way, the bragging rights of being a Jew? Verse 2, much, every way, chiefly because that, that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, if, if not every Jew believed, does that mean that, that what we were given of the Jews is not true? Notice verse 4, God forbid... Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. If our righteousness commended the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? I love that little dialogue right there. Just because there's some Jews that may not believe, does that mean that what we received, is the oracles of God, is not true? If God forbid. Of course they're true. Let God be true and every man a liar. But then he goes in verse 5, But if our unrighteousness, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God. What about us? If, so what if you're not a Jew? What if your unrighteousness? What if, what if the unrighteousness of the Gentiles? What if we are carrying the gospel message to our family, our friends, our co-workers, and they know things about us, and by the way, they'll point them out and they'll remind us of them, won't they? They, all, they say, and I believe it to be completely true, the hardest people to witness to is those that you're closest to. 
And the reason is because they know so much about us. And we know that they're going to bring it up, or at least the potential of them is bringing it up is there. And it says, but what if our, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God? What shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? He said, I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? If God is going to take those that pass the word along, and if God wasn't going to allow a sinner, if God wasn't going to allow someone that was not perfect, if God was not going to allow someone that had stumbled and stumped their spiritual toe, if God wasn't going to let, allow that person to carry the gospel, then who would the gospel be carried to? How could he be the judge of the world? Unless the world has the opportunity to do that which is right and trust Christ. How can he be a righteous judge and judge righteously unless people have a choice to make between choosing or not choosing Christ? So he uses us. He uses the Jew, the Gentile. He uses the unrighteous. He uses the unsaved. He uses the circumcision and the uncircumcision. He uses all of us to carry the gospel. And it's not us that determines the purity of the gospel. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Verse 7, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto His glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whoso damnation is just. In Romans chapter 5, don't turn there, basically what he's talking about is the same thing we find in Romans chapter 5. If, if grace abounds where sin abounds, then why not just allow more sin? <laughs> That's not right. And, and, and he's saying here, and he's declaring here, Paul is saying, he said, and not rather, notice this, as we be slanderously reported, the people are lying about what they're saying. And the lie they're saying, we find out here, I'm trying to find my place, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that, that good may come. That's not what Paul's message was. People were slanderously saying that. Because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And people were twisting the words of God through the apostle's mouth and saying, oh, so we should just let evil people be evil because therefore grace will abound that much more. There'll be more grace for where there's more sin. Listen, that doesn't mean that we continue in sin. That just means that you can never get so low that grace can't reach you. That's all that means. It doesn't mean that there should be more sin in our life. We should live holy for He is holy. But it does mean no matter where you find yourself or no matter where you find someone else, grace is still sufficient to reach down and pull them out of that hole that they're in. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that we are all under sin. Notice the punctuation. We're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Notice the punctuation. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Notice this real quickly before we move any farther. Did you notice the punctuation as we come down through some of those verses there? There's not very many end of sentences. There's not very many periods. The whole context of what he's talking about is basically what he declared at the beginning. Every man, every man can say things that are untrue. But that does not defile the Word of God. Just because you and I may have things in our past that people can bring up, 
doesn't mean that we can't be saved by the marvelous grace of God and, and be changed in a moment. The old passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And now we can carry the word of God, regardless of our past, to the unbelieving of the world. And even if we stump our spiritual toe once again and, and something comes out of our mouth that shouldn't come out of our mouth and, and we have, have a quick temper that we ought not have against someone that we ought not have it towards and or we behave in a way that we ought not behave, that doesn't mean that we can't get right back on the altar and the throne of grace be found there again where it can be forgiven and, and God can forget and it will be cast aside again. It doesn't mean that. It just means that if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves the same place we find many other people. The Bible says there, verse 9 and 10, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that we are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. That is one sentence. The context is none of us are worthy. <laughs> and then he goes on, verse 12, They are all gone out of the way. Every one of us. There are those that have not trusted Christ and they are acting exactly the way like sinners act. They're behaving themselves as someone would behave themselves without the power of God working in and through their life. And there are those that slander you and those, are those that slander I. They'll say things that we said and they'll say them differently. They'll twist them. They'll take them out of context. They'll misuse them. They'll use things that we meant to be glory for God. They'll use them against God and against His glory and against us. But they slanderously say those things, Paul says. And the people that will do that and, spiteful, and spitefully use you and spitefully use myself and people that will spitefully use the, the things of God, the Bible says they are all going out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And then we have a, a, a sentence. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You can almost hear Paul saying it without catching your breath, can't you? You can literally, you can almost see him writing so quickly as he pins this down in this letter. You can almost see him pinning it down that he never lifts his pen off the page. He, you can almost, you can just see, you can see the, the love of God coming forth and the hate of sin because he sees what it does to people's lives. He doesn't hate the sinner, but he, he says there are those that are deceitful. The Bible says literally the poison of, of snakes, of asp, is under their tongue. They're out to harm us. There are so many things. The Bible says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it, is say, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I love that. Because what we find out is, the law was put there by God Almighty. But the law was put there by God Almighty not to save us. The law was put there so that we can realize by being under the law that we need to be saved. It humbles us. It doesn't rescue us. It humbles us. It makes us aware of our need of a Savior. And the next verse clarifies that. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of of God to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. That's one sentence. Paul may have got excited and aggravated and agitated when he was writing about the, those that had slandered him and slandered the other apostles and the men of God. He may have been aggravated and you can almost feel that. But he writes much longer about what God did for him and what God will do for others. 
his aggravation, his agitation, his hurriedness of writing those things down in frustration of the, of the lifestyle of the ungodly. But then he gets over here and he starts talking about the righteousness of God. He starts talking about Jesus Christ and he starts talking about deliverance and he starts talking about justification. He starts talking about the remission of sins. He starts talking about the forbearance of God. He starts talking about His righteousness. And He talks about the justifier. And He talks about it all comes by believing in Jesus. You can honestly, it's not aggravation now, it's excitement. He's writing these, he's pinning these down. He, you can hear, you can almost feel and see the Holy Spirit working in and through him. And, and, Holy, God, and God, Holy God is saying these things to this, to this apostle. He's writing these things down and you can see him. And it, I don't want to miss any of this. I want to write it down. He didn't want to leave anything out. He's talking about the goodness of God. But again, the verse that we often use, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all ascend and come short of the glory of God, we find that verse in the middle of a sentence where God is talking about, where Paul is talking about the righteousness of God. That is wonderful. When someone, let's be careful that we don't just leave someone in their sinful condition. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 10, verse 23, the same chapter. And both of those verses are in the middle of sentences. If we're not careful... The most memorable things they say that are ever, the most remembered things I should say that people ever hear are the first things and the last things. You start a conversation off wrong, you turn the person against you, no matter what you're going to say, it's hard to get them back on track because their mind's already going in a direction of frustration. Neither one of those sentences, neither one of those verses that we, I just quoted, 10 or 23, neither one of those are, in, are the first or last. Both of those are in the middle of a sentence. The reason I say that, point that out is because we don't need to talk to people and say, let me tell you what's going to happen, you're going to die and go to hell, and leave them in a condition of hell. We may use that phrase or, or similar phrase, we may make, try to make them aware, but we need to tell them about the righteousness of God. And what the righteousness of God can do for them. And they'll say, well, I'm not a church member. And you can say, well, there was a time that I wasn't either. Well, I'm not a Jew. And I'm not either. Well, I'm not a whatever. And you say, well, I'm not either. Well, I'm not a whatever. And that's just not who I am. Well, that's not who I was either. But God changed me. And I, I, listen, I, I know it's tough. My family's just like yours. My friends are just like yours. The people I run into every week is just like yours. They know more about me than I wish they knew. And I know it's tough. But it's even tougher to, for me to imagine my family burning in hell. It hurts me so much more to see my family separated for eternity from the love of God, separated eternity from anyone else, separated for eternity from the comfort the Holy Spirit alone can bring, separated from eternity for eternity from light, because who is light, by the way? Separated for eternity from grounding, falling in darkness without comfort, without hope of comfort, for eternity. That hurts me much more. That hurts me much more. So I need to remind them the righteousness of God in the Old Testament was still intact. The righteousness of God is intact in the New Testament because He changeth not. He's the same yesterday and forever. And verse 23 follows Verse 21 and 22, where all it's talking about the righteousness of God. And it's followed up by saying in verse 23, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could tell people this? God is righteous. He only does that which is right. He can do nothing that is wrong. 
And he died on Calvary for you because that was right. And he wants you to be saved because that is right. His blood will save you for eternity because that is right. And without his blood, you recognize you're a sinner because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But don't leave that as the last part of the sentence. Notice the next part of verse 23. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could conclude it by saying, but you can be justified freely. Because here's what people tell you. They tell me the same thing. I'm going to come to church someday. I'm going to, when I straighten some things out in my life, I'll be there. We say, no, no, no. Christ can straighten everything out. If you'll just come to Him because of His righteousness, He'll, he'll do it right. And I know you're a sinner because I was just like you. I was without Christ too. And you're not part of the, the body of Christ and the bride of Christ yet because you've not trusted Him, but you can be because He will justify you. He will make you as if you had never been a sinner, just as if I'd never sinned, justified. He'll make you that way. He says whom God has set for to be a propitiation, a suitable, acceptable sacrifice for sin. Because that's what's right. God won't give an interim or a substitute sacrifice. He'll only give the right sacrifice because He's righteous. The suitable, the acceptable sacrifice. Through faith in His blood. To declare His righteousness again, His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. And by the way, that's the only time the word remission is used differently in the Bible. That's the only time where that word remission does not mean exactly what we talked about this morning. That's the only time where that that is a slightly different use of the word. That's a slightly different use of the word remission in the fact that it doesn't mean the same exact thing that that it is healed and paid for. It's forgiven and paid for. It just means, notice this, we have to look at the context, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. That that remission of sins that are past means His... I don't want to to use this correctly. I want you to pray for me right here. His toleration of the sin that are past, that is past. Not His acceptance. There's a big difference in those two things. The toleration of the sin of the past. How many of you are wonderfully excited to see that he's a long-suffering Savior? (laughs) To me, that's one of his greatest attributes. That he's long-suffering to me. This word of remission, this use of remission is the only time. Look it up. Take a strong concordance. Look it up for yourself. It's the only time that the word remission is used differently. It's not completely a different use. It's a different time frame. Notice, we have to notice some of the words here. And I'm not an English teacher, and you can help me with this. We can notice some things here that will help us. Whom God has set forth, we get the direction. God has set forth Jesus Christ, the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. Whom Christ has set forth going forward to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. God's righteousness. Christ did not begin at Bethlehem, right? That's just when He was made visible. That's when He was manifested before us. But Christ has been around before there was time. There's no beginning and no end to the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. One God, a trinity. And at no point in time has there been a time when God wasn't. At no point in time has there been a time when Christ wasn't. And at no point in time has there been a time when the Holy Spirit wasn't. And at no point in time will there ever be a time when they won't be. The Bible says here, whom God has set forth to be a suitable sacrifice for our sin, a propitiation through faith in His blood. Even before we were there to declare our faith in Christ, It was still set forth. It was set forth ahead of time. To declare His righteousness, His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. 
You see the context here? You see the direction? He set forth ahead of time for His righteousness to be declared for the remission of sins that are past. There are those many thousands and millions that lived before Christ came to Calvary. And there are those in this room, all of us in this room, there's a point in time in our life where we were without Christ. If you trusted Christ, there's a point in time that had passed when you was without Christ and there was sin in your life that God has since forgiven and cast aside as far as the east is from the west. But God set forth that suitable sacrifice for sin even before you and I needed it or recognized our need of it. Because He's always right. He's always righteous. And His righteousness, notice this, His righteousness, He declared His righteousness for the remission, His toleration, if you let me use that word, not acceptance, he did, he, sin's never been acceptable in God's eyes, but if, for His toleration of the sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, again, I love the fact that we can take this sentence, this sentence, that contains verse 23 about we all sin. We've all come short of the glory of God. We can take this sentence and begin it and end this sentence, sentence with the righteousness of God. I love that. My family needs that. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It's not that I'm just justified because of my works. We'll talk about that. I'm justified by His righteousness. He's the only one that, 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 that can declare that which is right. Therefore, He's the only one that can justify me. He's the only one that can justify you. He's the only one that can declare it's just as if you'd never sinned. He's the only one that can say that. Because you and I can't say that. I can't say that about you and you can't say it about me. And the president and leaders of this world can't say that. But the one that uses the earth as his footstool can. The Bible goes on to say in verse 26, 27, where is boasting then? Notice the punctuation. Where is boasting then? How are you going to brag? What are you going to bring about? It is excluded. That's not a question mark. That's a declarative statement. It's excluded. There is no boasting. Because we can't justify anyone. We can't be the justifier even of ourselves. Because we know that there's sin that's visited our life. We know that we just read from the previous verse, there's things in our life that made us a sinner in need of salvation. We know that there's things that we've read already in this chapter that have declared that there's none righteous, there's no not one. We know that, that all the sin comes short of the glory of God, and we know that we are one of those. And that's why it says, where is boasting? It's excluded. Hold your place. I just want to read you something real quickly. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's a sentence. That's a sentence. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't boast. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Question mark. Is he not also the Gentiles? Question mark. Yes, the Gentiles also. You see the word also there? The word also means there has to be more than one involved. It's the Jews and the Gentiles. He declared himself when he was on the earth, I am the Messiah. And the Jews received him not. But the declaration was there. 
I know there are Orthodox Jews that are still looking for the return of the Messiah the first time. They didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They rejected Him. He came to His own, His own received Him not. But just because they didn't accept it does not mean it wasn't right. Because His righteousness declared it. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he the, not, all, not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, the Jews and the Gentiles. Seeing it is one God which shall, be justifi- which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Question mark. God forbid. Yea, we established the law. We just went through the entire chapter. We didn't spend a lot of time. But I think we spent enough time to help us realize there's a whole lot more in Romans chapter 3 than just the fact that we're a sinner. I think we can take the message of Romans chapter 3 and lead someone to the Lord without having to flip everywhere else in the Bible to find verses that we take out of context and take out of the middle of a sentence. I think we could take just this one chapter and show someone how to be saved. It's not just the only chapter, by the way. I'm just showing us because, can I be honest with you? I don't have one in my pocket because I had this suit ready to be clean, so I cleaned it out, but I didn't get the cleaners yet. But if you opened up our tracks many times, you'll find just a verse out of context. How many of you realize and recognize that Romans chapter, I mean, we have something that's often referred to as a Romans road. And by the way, I'm not in opposition of that by any means. Please don't, please don't slander my words this evening. But we're guilty of starting off by saying a verse that's not even in context It's not even a complete sentence. We're guilty. I love the conclusion of this chapter. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. You find that phrase, God forbid, so many times in this one chapter. You know what he's saying? There's a lot of things that have been said, a lot of things have been done, a lot of things are being said that's not exactly accurate. We need to stop it. God forbid. We don't make void the law. God gave the law. And for anyone that would say, well, I don't believe the law, I don't believe the law is necessary, and I don't want want to hear that stuff about the law, then they are wrong because He is right. And the righteousness of God is fulfilled. I mean, the law is fulfilled in the righteousness of God. The law was given not to save a man. It was never given to save a man. Look with me real quickly again. Look at, uh, look at verse, 20, or no, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who were under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You see what the law does? The law makes us guilty. That's why the law was given. The law was never given for salvation. The law was only given to prove our need of salvation. So the law is still in effect. The law carries no more power than it ever did. And it carries no less power than it ever did. The law is still in effect. And we prove the effectiveness of the law of God through our lives that He has made righteous righteous through Him. We prove the effect of the law. How many, of you, how many of you, when you were saved, how many when you trusted Christ your Savior by lifting your hand, how many would say, I got saved because I wanted to go to heaven? How many would say that? How many of you would say, I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell? How many would say that? 
How many of you got saved because you recognized that you needed Jesus Christ to forgive your sins? How many of you would say that? Ha oh, ha, that got all of you. You know why you know that? The law. The law. Nah, I don't even know the law. Okay, then how did you know you did something wrong? I'm not being silly. Honestly. How did you know you were guilty then? Unless there was a law to guide you. You may not, you may not have known every area you were guilty in, <laughs> but you knew enough, and so did I, to realize I was guilty. By the way, when I got saved, I didn't know I knew almost nothing of heaven and almost nothing of Christ, but I did know He was willing to save me. So just because I didn't know much of Christ in heaven doesn't mean that He didn't save me. Just because I didn't know much of the law, the law, the law, just because I didn't know much of the law doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't make me guilty. I knew enough of it to be found guilty. How does your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, how do they know when they're in trouble? Because you say to them, did you know better than that? Yes, the law. The law. I say to you tonight, Romans chapter 3 is a wonderful chapter, and until recently, I had never given it in my own personal life as much thought as I have recently. It's one of those chapters that I ran through, and you have the same text in your life too, by the way, so let's point like this, all right? It's one of those chapters that I ran through because I'm saved by grace and I want to get on over in about chapter 6 or 7 where it starts talking to the saved. I know what it was like to be unsaved and I really don't want to think about it anymore. But truth be told, it's not talking about the unsaved, it's talking about how we get saved. <laughs> it's talking to the unbeliever on how they get saved just like it speaks to you and I on how we got saved. Last verse one more time. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. We establish the law. God's righteousness being settled in, in us and through us and being established in us, not to mean that we're perfect yet, one of these days we will receive a glorified body. And the things that hurts this flesh right now, that, that, that causes pain on my life, the things that causes emotional pain, physical pain, and stress, and, and, and ulcers, and all those things, those things won't even be around. And the things that, that aging does to us, and the creaks and the cracks, and the, the thin bones, and the lack of balance, and all those things, those things won't even be around. But can I say something to you this evening? This is just a personal testimony. That's not what I'm excited about the most. What I'm excited about the most is this. That the things that tempt me apart from the righteousness of Christ won't be around. That's what I'm excited about. The day that this flesh won't be tempted away from the righteousness of Christ. That's going to be wonderful. Oh, it's not. Oh, well, you mean oh, I can't wait to be, be in heaven where I won't be around the, all these mean people. And that's what they think of you. And that's what they think of I. So let me ask you a question. Have you given much thought to the fact that one of these days our faith will be sight? And it's easy to say and get excited about certain little aspects of that. Of, oh, I'm, I'm hurting so bad I can't wait till this pain's gone. Oh, a, a day when loved ones will never pass away. A day when friends will never die. And, and we need to be excited about those things. But I'm not discrediting or diminishing those in any way. Please, please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But you know what causes all those pains and hurts? The presence of sin. And one of these days, by the way, if you're saved, you've already been saved from the penalty of sin. One of these days, you're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. That's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day.
And it's by faith in the righteousness of God that we're going to get to do that. Lord, we come to you tonight. I thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for using this chapter of the Bible in my own life. Lord, thank you for showing me some things that I needed. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word that I may have it and hold it and read it and learn from it. Lord, thank you for dying on Calvary for my sin. Thank you for the promise of your return. Thank you for the presence that I'm going to experience one day in heaven with my Savior. Thank you for the peace that passeth all understanding. Lord, I want to thank you for your blood. Thank you for paying for my sins so that I don't have to worry and fear and question but it can be settled forever in heaven on you I stand and upon your righteousness Lord I pray that you'd help me be the pastor that you want me to be the husband and the father Lord that you want me to be but Lord above all help me be the Christian that you saved me to be Lord I pray that you'd use every one of us for your glory, for your worthy. Help us to praise you as we go on our way. Help us to testify of you this week. And help us to live worthy of the name that's been given us as a Christian. We thank you for all that you do for us now. Keep us safe until we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.